is Bill Sly. And this is an interview with Aaron. The date is August 25th, 2013. We're in Fairfield, New Jersey. Aaron, could you state your full name? Aaron Bernstein. I, what I'd like to do is start off with, you start giving some personal information. Okay. Um, whatever you'd like to give, uh, talking about, start from the beginning. You want me to look at the camera there or no? No, right. you can look at me. Let's talk to Bill. Okay. Ready? Go. I'm a 72-year-old Vietnam veteran. I grew up in Newark and Kearney, New Jersey. My father left my mother and sister and me, and I never saw him again. The judge in Kearney represented my mom in her divorce from my delinquent father. He knew, the judge, he knew that I had to help my family to survive. After graduating from Seton Hall in 1962, I tried to find a job. No company would hire you. Companies didn't want to train you. Then you lose you to the draft. So I pushed up my number. The judge, the judge helped me obtain my top secret crypto clearance. And I was able to help my country in the many different ways I served in the military. I was off to boot camp at Fort Dix after ROTC. <laughs> Freedom is a precious gift that never can be lost. Worth living for, worth dying for, to protect at any cost. And though I can no longer serve, you will always see in me someone proud to be a veteran and someone thankful to be free. After graduating from Seton Hall, I tried to find a job, as I said, and uh, there was no jobs, no companies would hire you because of the draft. And uh, I was off to boot camp in Fort Dix, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Basic training was equally equal to two years of an ROTC that I had in Seton Hall, Reserve Officers Training Corps. And, um, you know, it was a pretty thorough uh, military situation. And order of arms they did, map reading, marching, rifle, marksmanship. Some of weapons, using gas masks, hand to hand combat skills, chemical warfare, bayonet training, map reading, basic first aid, physical fitness, advanced infantry training, obstacle course completions, which is drills, advanced everything. We were taught all of these things at basic training and beyond. I became a private first class PFC, combat trained killer. Four months living with 60 soldiers in a barracks, doing your own cleaning, laundry, eating so-called mass food, marching, sleeping in bunk beds, walking on command. Everything was daunting for me. And mama's boys, mama boy, mama's boys did not do well. And I remember my arrival at Fort Dix, a company barracks living. A tall, lanky kid from Kentucky was staring at me after roll call that first day. Staring, staring, staring. I finally asked him, why, why are you staring at me for so long? He replied that he had never seen a Jew before. He thought they had horns and big noses. He was serious. When he realized I was angry, he apologized profusely, saying that was what he was taught. And, you know, he was from Kentucky. He didn't know any better. I guess what I should talk to you about is, well, first of all, let me say that the judge in Corny was my mom's attorney, and he represented her in, in her divorce from my delinquent father, and stopped me from being beaten by the Corny police who hated Jews. He also obviously knew, as the only Jew in Corny with no father, I had to help my family to survive with the only opportunities I had to do so. The judge helped me to obtain my top secret crypto clearance. 
and I was able to help my country in many different ways I served in the military. Many years later, there was a TV hit show called The Sopranos about a so-called mafia organization from Corny. These characters portrayed on TV were actually the people and friends I grew up with as a child. Talk about irony. Anyway, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's my autobiography right there. It's also the title of an autobiography and a hit song by Kelly Clarkson. But anyway, my life is a fascinating true story of survival and heroism. In the face of horrific adversity and my death by torture in the jungles of Vietnam and Cambodia. And I survived. I used to stay to go to the AMP on Corny Avenue and wait, you know, with the carts for people so I could walk them to their car and unload their their whatever they bought and people would give me a quarter. 50 cents, and that's that's how I survived. Um, I did a picture of the Sopranos right here. <laughs> anyway, um, to continue, again, as the only Jew among 60 soldiers in my barracks, the anti-Semitism cropped up again. Our drill sergeant was an Italian Special Forces Airborne Ranger who was no tougher, meaner, physically fit member of the armed forces. Unfortunately, he hated Jews also. He immediately took a strong dislike toward me. I later found out that he previously had a soldier basic with the same last name as me, who brought the company ratings down because of, you know, by being a, a total incompetent soldier. When the drill sergeant used my last name only, he loudly stressed the Stein in Bernstein. It got in my face. <laughs> Whenever he addressed me, here we go again, I thought. However, he didn't realize I took two years of ROTC at Seton Hall. I knew all the commandments, formations, order of arms, combat training, etc. Basically, the whole basic training, 10 week course. I actually showed him up. I knew he hated me and my religion, so it was just a matter of time before he physically confronted me. Finally, it happened. We agreed to go to the back of the barracks to settle our dislike for each other. He landed the first punch, but I got in a shot and way to the ground that bloodied his nose. He never bothered me again. I was a fighter. I had to fight in Corny, as you probably could understand. Well, I can understand it growing up in Corny uh, also. that. Um, not yeah. easy. It, it wasn't even easy for a Scotsman among Scotsmen. Among Scotsmen. Scotsmen. people. Yeah. 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 So that was my first thing at, you know, the military. First time in my military career. Uh, in Fort Dix, it was, I had bivouac in Fort Dix. That was my military career start. And, uh, you know, there were 75 soldiers including me. We were packed into a flatbed tractor trailer truck. We had a camp out in a forest, heavily treed, about eight miles from the barracks of Fort Dix. We all slept two in a tent near a tree or trees that hung a lister bag on it, these giant canvas bags that held all our, our drinking and washing water. As a city boy, this was not fun for me. Um, unfortunately, one of our soldiers was killed all the troops pushing against the truck camp doing transportation to the campsite. Uh, we all, you know, evacuated the flat plate, that truck we were on. We saw the, show, the soldier, he was pushed up against the camp of the truck. And he, was, uh, he wasn't breathing or moving. They pronounced him dead and removed him from the flat bed. God rest his soul. That's just my, my first, you know, story about bivouac at Fort Dix. Anyway. From there I went to advanced infantry training at Fort Niagara. Fort Niagara and Niagara Falls Air Force Base was a huge pilot training facility and hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat infantry training base. We also had live ammunition, weapons, including machine guns, rockets, hand grenades, bayonet, combat training, and infantry maneuvers. As our troops would would crawl flat to the sand ground, lie
live ammo was flying past him. The unbelievable happened. The sergeant was screaming for everyone to keep their head down. And one of the soldiers raised his head screaming from a panic attack. And the live fire blew his head apart. We were all horrified and stunned at this fatality. God rest his soul. Lieutenant Johnson. Lieutenant Johnson was my superior officer. I was a corporal, and he was my commanding officer. Besides us, there were few college grads at our base. Lieutenant Johnson was recently graduated from Penn State. We not only became good friends, which is frowned upon in the military, we also flew in an L-19 fixed-wing plane for many of my and his missions in Vietnam and elsewhere. We both survived. The lieutenant took me with him to Fort Totten in Brooklyn, New York. He was, a, he was on a secret mission, but it was near his family in New York. We had a great time at the fort and the clubs that were on or in it. It was near both our homes and families, so we saw them both. We partied hardy together before we returned to the base in the missile master. Neither of us would ever forget our service and the bond we formed with our missions. We were an inspiration to each other, Fellow, fellow warriors, we survived. Now, Fort Totten, was that that um, fairly ancient, circular fort that you can see the, uh, it's on the lower water. Manhattan? Yeah, it's on the water. Right. It's on the water. It, it was actually built for the hold cannons, right? right. So here I am, basic training for it takes. I was shipped out, deployed to a joint Army and Air Force base in Lockport, New York, near Buffalo and Niagara Falls. It housed a top secret facility within a mountain, a city that contained the Army Air Defense Command, the RADCOM, top secret missile master, missile master. From inside this mountain, the nuclear missiles in silos that were spread across the northern USA that could be launched. Also, 50% of all our aircraft and ships had to be deployed in all times. But no one could enter the city within the mountain without a security force. I was singularly allowed to disseminate my top secret crypto messages, faxed to me, twixt to me, in my office within this base, which I hand carried to the colonel who commanded the base. And I was one of two soldiers there that had a top secret crypto clearance, um, beside Lieutenant Johnson. And after an extensive investigation by the Secret Service, FBI, Department of Defense, and several law enforcement agencies, I was granted my top secret crypto clearance. Um, the president doesn't have a top secret crypto clearance. There's a field grade officer that carries a black box with the launch codes of our nuclear arsenal and is always near and with the president. He has the launch codes and the black bodies and, he, and the top crypto clearance. The president doesn't have the need to know. The nuclear missiles were raised from their silos twice, when President Kennedy was assassinated and when the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred. And they were scary times. So, how did I wind up in Vietnam? Were you drafted? I pushed my number. Okay. Because nobody would, would hire me to I couldn't right. get a job. Right. So you, you went in and enlisted. I went in and pushed my number up. Pushed Which up my numbers. Uh, that was the one thing I didn't understand. Yeah, was. you could push up your number. You had to uh, serve for at least two years. Okay. Oh, I see. Because I, I, I had, of course, the lottery. You didn't have the lottery yeah. at your stage. Yeah. And uh, when the lottery came around for me in 1972, I was 312. So I got the pass, which I accepted. Do you want to Do you want to know more about my childhood? I had a horrible childhood. Uh, I had a fight to stay alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was terrible. Mm -hmm. And my mother, we were starving. We had no food. I mean, mm -hmm. I had to do things I'm not proud of. But we I, survived. I, I read most of that in your Did you read the, uh, the bio, yeah. yes. 
and you know, how did I wind up in Vietnam or Cambodia? Who knows? <laughs> where, where else? I was a courier delivering top secret crypto coded messages somewhere in the Mekong Delta. And uh, they would I would fly with uh, Lieutenant Johnson to, mostly with him, to board an L-19 fixed wing small plane with a briefcase handcuffed to my wrist. I would finish the drop in a helicopter in the middle of the jungle that had been napalm first and saturated with Agent Orange, which I have. Um, I'm getting compensation for that all over the place, and I'll show that to you. So you, you felt that, that it did affect you? Absolutely. Well, yeah. I have compensation uh, right. yeah, mm -hmm. pending for, for that. I was I have cancers. All, I have cancers all over, mm -hmm. all over me, and uh, it was it was a horrible horrible. Yeah. We were on the we were, we were on the base. We weren't on the base. We had a uh, we had a beeper to return to the Iraqcom base. Mm -hmm. The sergeant that was in our company lived near me, so he would he picked me up and he would you know rush us to the base. He had 15 minutes to get there. Right. And this is what happened. Mm -hmm. He was going like 90 miles an hour. What, he, he lost a, control? He lost, just, control, just lost of the car. control of the car. He hit a, a telephone pole, uh -huh. and we, we wound up in a ditch upside so down. So like this pole and then the, right. the one that's in the picture? Right. 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 And this is what it, what, it, what happened. Mm -hmm. So this is the, uh, the, the report. Mm -hmm. This is what happened. I was near death a couple of times. Mm -hmm. No, this was after Vietnam? Um, Is it saying here, Agent Orange? Yes. So this is like it was after the... Uh, no, it wasn't after Vietnam. It, we were uh, hit with the Agent Orange in Vietnam. Right. As a matter of fact, I have the whole... So this is boot camp? No, this was uh, at the Iraq Company's. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't have that. Well, I did wind up in, in the Macon Delta, mm -hmm. you know, Bodhi or wherever that one was, I didn't even know. And I carried a handgun and a poison pill around my neck. And if I were captured, they would kill me anyway after torturing me, so I had an option of how to die. If I couldn't transfer the briefcase within the two minutes, I would have been dead. Colonel luckily had the key and quickly took the police case and all the crypto and launch codes. You know, talk about stress and anxiety. If either of us were captured, the briefcase had a button to incinerate the contents immediately. The other thing I'll always remember is the smell of death, a smell you never forget. From enemy troops napalm and doused with aging orange to clear the drop zone prior to the helicopter. Lieutenant, yeah. enemy combatants who were firing at our helicopter and our soldiers on the ground, and the lieutenant shouted, you know, neutralize the enemy combatants that were firing at us. Uh, I had my M1 rifle at the ready. If you see my VT-214, I was a marksman. I was able to wound many of the numbers of fire militants that fired on us from our helicopter hovering overhead ready to vacate the palace and enemy combatants on the ground hiding in the jungle. The Agent Orange is a herbicide that killed the bushes and trees and some of the enemy troops actually hid in those trees and bushes. We couldn't wait to evacuate the drop site and care for anybody who was wounded because they were warriors. And if this combat doesn't uh, count as deserving, plus all my, my wounds from the accident, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, with some of the missions that hospitalized me, I don't know what else will bestow the Purple Heart on me, and I'm waiting to, to get that I'm trying right now. Um, 
I have pictures to show you of the battle zone where I was and enemy combatants. All of them. I have it right here. And, and that Agent Orange caused all my cancers. The cancer of the liver I had, the cancer of the pancreas, the cancer of the stomach, mild duct cancer, ampullary tree cancer, small intestinal cancer, months of highly toxic chemotherapy, gastric bypasses, and four brutal operations. And this is all the Sloan Kettle, which is in my thing that I showed it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they came and got me after I was in the car, I crashed and wound up in a ditch. I was taken by ambulance. Luckily, the sergeant called the ambulance and they came and got me. They took me to the VA hospital in Buffalo. And uh, I had horrible and gruesome injuries. From 1962 to 64, I was in the hospital for about a month and a half. And I had to have my bones reset, I had broken ribs face fractures, horrible, bruise. And the other thing I had, of course, the cancer treatments and the surgeries I just told you about. Um, and the Agent Orange exposure for my missions, which I'm getting compensation for. Mm -hmm. how, how long was your service in, in uh, Vietnam? Uh, I'm not done yet. done yet. It, it was quite a while. Mm -hmm. But I would say probably 62 to 63 and a half. And then I had my cancer treatments and surgeries due to the Agent Orange for my admissions. And at Sloan Kettering, I had to undergo brutal operations at the cancer hospital there. And it, was, it was tough. It's, it's a miracle I survived. And, um, I was stationed in Lockport, Lockport Air Force Station up in the Niagara Frontier. And it was, a, it was a key defense base for the Niagara Frontier. This base was, was buzzing with radar images and radio signals as airmen on duty watched the skies over the Niagara Frontier and over the Northeast United States, USA. It was a Cold War, and this air station had a population of several hundred housed with the barbed wire fences and the high security installation. It was a city within a mountain that was lead and cement lined to withstand the nuclear missile attack. The RADCOM, Army Air Defense Command, covered the entire East Coast Command. I spent one and a half years in Lockport and worked and at Lockport Air Force Station. And then a half a year in uh, Oakfield, Pennsylvania with Battery Commander Captain. Griffin and Colonel DeSalt, about four, three or four months. Um, if, as, and when the command was given to launch the nuclear missile, nuclear and Nike missiles, they would rise out of the ground, hidden by trees, cement, hatches, etc., ten stories high. Two men were in the silos, one with the launch key, the other with the hand gun. The soldier with the gun was rotated with someone else daily. If the soldier with the launch key would or could not launch the nuclear missile on command, the soldier with the gun would shoot him and take the launch key and launch the missile, if that's what he had to do. Uh, those alerts only happened twice during my service. Now, was this the one where you would have to turn two keys at the exact same time? For yes. It to work? How'd you know that? I think that's true. You know, quite a bit. Yes. You do. I actually live three blocks from the Nike base. Did you really? In Wayne. There was a Nike base. Yeah. You know how they had the Nike bases that's, that rimmed New York? New York yes. Okay, yes. that were in a circular pattern. Um, equal circular They're still pattern. up there. It's, they're still up there. Hey. I'll, show, I'll show you. Well, well, I had an important question for you. Because we, are you familiar with the magazine uh, Weird New Jersey? No. It is... It looks at curiosities in the state of New Jersey, and even they call it a fringe tour. They look at New York or Pennsylvania, that type of thing. 
and the publisher, there's two publishers, Mark and Mark, and uh, the one publisher um, lived in, it was not, not where I am, I can't remember the, the town now, but he was where the large base was. And so he talks, he writes about it often. And the big question was, and he's been searching for this for years, were there any nuclear weapons that were used at these, at these particular bases in New Jersey? I'm sure you can't really answer that question. You haven't been to those particular bases. But I'm sure, and, you, and, and when you're talking about 10 stories tall, I don't believe that was the case. But that is one of the grand mysteries about the Nike bases that were in New York City and New York State too, because they went up and around up into New York State too. Westchester uh, was where they're nuclear. And so, what was the real question? I mean, what you were dealing with in a Nike weapon was nuclear tipped. It was offensive to attack. Well, would, would they have used a nuclear weapon in in Vietnam? I don't think so. However, there is no record. How? Right. I don't think so. Yes. However, I wouldn't say no. Either. Right. It depend. Don't forget, this was this is when we were at war. Right. So you use whatever weapon. I think it was probably a stopgap. In other words, they were using it as a threat. As a threat. That's as what it threat. was. And of course, it didn't work because they ended up taking over South Vietnam. So we even have something with the Cuban Missile thing where they were involved. Right. And uh, well, you it, were, were were you at the time of the Kennedy assassination and the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis? Were you on American soil at that point, or were you still in Vietnam or before Vietnam? That would be 19... I was still in the Vietnam. That would have been about right, 1960? Yeah. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course, the Kennedy assassination was 1963. 1962, I was there. Right. So it was after you came back. So it was before you went. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is where... I'll let you get this. You know, these the alerts only happened twice during my service. They were scary. I'll never forget them. Every every airman and soldier was stationed around the base with clickers, clickers at night that you buy for kids at the toy store, and we mm -hmm. give, gave them out to everybody. That was my idea. Everyone had one to click to make sure you could answer or click at night not be shot or invaded by any enemy. We were all fully armed and no more than 20 feet apart. Talk about stress, anxiety, tension, and fear. Nobody could penetrate the fence barrier without a clicker. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Clickers. Toy store clickers. Mm -hmm. have to go into my childhood. You know what it was like for a Jew in the morning. It wasn't anything that I'm proud of. And, you know, I had to do things I probably shouldn't have done to survive. If, you had to survive. If it's of any comfort to you, I would think, I'm Scottish. You, you were among Scots. I had trouble too. I couldn't stand being but you're not Wait Scottish. to get out of there. Are you Scottish? I'm Scottish. I didn't know. Okay. So you couldn't wait if to get it's out any of here. comfort, I think they just wanted to fight. Period. I got the crap with that. We, every we, day. Well, we, we, I, had the, I had a fight every day. I had the same problem. Same thing? Yeah. So it didn't matter that I was on the same team. Well, I didn't have a weapon to defend yeah, myself exactly. either. Exactly. Yeah. My yeah. life was hell for years. Mine too, for years. I had no father. No father. 
no income. Luckily, my uncle put us in the, in this apartment. Right, I, I read about the story about your your uncle. Yeah, my uncle, God bless his son. Mm -hmm. And um, it was tough. Mm -hmm. It was tough growing up in Corny. It was. It was, not easy. It was for me too. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Um. <clears throat> you know, a lot of my duty was to escort the caskets of our fallen heroes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them came, the caskets came into uh, Dover Air Force Base, which was right. a big base for Vietnam veterans. Yes, Delaware. Delaware, right. And it, it was just, we had, part of my duty was to escort the caskets mm -hmm. of these fallen heroes at the base. And that's where most Vietnam veterans' caskets were brought, you know, with full honors and flag and salutes, etc. And the base was the was the primary depository of the bodies prior to them being interred. interred. And I had never before witnessed the outpouring of emotions, tears, sobbing by the families. It was hard. It was, and I have pictures of little kids mm -hmm. crying, knowing that their, their fathers never were dead. It was, it was just hard. That was one of the things I really dreaded and hated in knowing the military of Vietnam and being involved with the, uh, the heroes at the Dover Air Base. And never mind the, and the people. The people that, you know, it was just all the families that they did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, anyway. So you, you were told that it was to fight the spread of communism. Um, no, nobody told me. No? What were you, why did you go to, what do you think you went to Vietnam for? It was drafted. It was what? It was drafted. I didn't want to go. Yeah, yeah. But I had to go. Right. Because basically, my belief is, when war happens, someone makes money. And so we're looking at the Gulf, Gulf of Tonkin, and we know now that that was all contrived, that that was a complete lie. It was to get us into the war. And when war happens, uh, those corporations that have ar that supply armaments make vast sums of money. The people who make Agent Orange make some vast huge, sums huge. of money. And that's what really what war is really about. Well, and what did we end up with? Fifty-three thousand men perished. Mm -hmm. But yes, you know. Yes, yes. I wasn't involved with money. I wasn't involved with anything. Mm -hmm. I had to serve. I agreed to serve. I did the best I could. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. I wasn't a hero. Never say I was. Mm -hmm. I did witness a lot of things that nobody else would witness. Right. I grew up in Corny, as yes. you did. Yes. And uh, I'm just happy that I'm alive. Right. And I've done things well, to help what you've people. been through, especially with the cancers. That was the worst. Yes. And it's still ongoing. Right. It's still Understood. ongoing. But I seem to be doing okay here. Good. Sloan Kettering saved my life. A lot of things saved my life. Anyway, <laughs> did you? We were talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis? Yes, Let, before we get into that, let's continue with the Vietnam veterans aspect of it. Um, I know quite a few vet Vietnam veterans. Some are relatives, some are close friends. None of them want to discuss what happened in Vietnam. My own cousin was in Vietnam, his own, his family didn't know. I'm the only one that knows in the family that he was in Vietnam. And did you feel that way up until this point? Did you feel that you really didn't want to talk about your experiences in Vietnam? Because most of them, most of the ones I know will not discuss it. I discussed it. You did discuss it. Yes. I 
disgusting because I lived it. The, it's it's and it was horrible. It's it's and actually you know when you have something horrible, better it's better to discuss. But I have friends tell, who, talk to somebody. About I have friends who are bottled up. They won't discuss it. A clo very close friend of mine. I was close to that. Told me, don't ask me about it. So I have to follow his wishes and not bring it up. He won't talk about it. It's hard for me to talk about. It. I'm sure it is. Very hard. And I lost a lot of good friends. Yes. Uh, didn't get know. any support back here in the United States. No. no. All the strife that there was here. And nothing to do with Vietnam, Cambodia, and all the yeah. rest. Yeah. You know, okay. Now, what about readjusting to normal life after your return? That's a good question. I think I sequestered myself. I, I didn't want to know from anything. Mm -hmm. I had endured this horrible thing that I did for our country. I had to do it. And I did whatever I could. Right. But I wasn't proud of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I had to do what I had to do, and I did what I, did. So mm -hmm. I was supposed to do. But I don't want to talk about it either. I'll talk about it now with you because of you know, Jesse and, and this. But I'm not really happy talking about it either. But I was there. I was wounded. And the one thing I want is my purple horn. Mm -hmm. I was wounded, as you saw, with that accident and everything. And, and that was going, you know, with the sergeant doing all these things to me. Right. And, uh, have trouble readjusting afterwards? Yes. Yeah, I, I would think you would. Yes. I saw too much exactly. that I don't want to talk about. Yes. I saw death. I saw people, people. This guy that I tell you was crawling, his head was blown off. Right. I mean, to see that. Right, yes. You never, you never forget that. Right, of course. And that's, that's the stuff. That's the stuff I don't want to Now, you remember. also mentioned, because of your crypto, that there was... Top secret crypto. The top secret crypto, that you had debriefing type, if you could call it that. You, you mentioned... It was it. highly classified. Right. And uh, you weren't allowed to talk about it. But was, was there any debriefing that was done before you came back to the States? I thought you mentioned in there that there might have been some mind control hypnotism that was done. Yes. Now, who yes. did that hypnotism? Uh, an officer. And he so was he a psychiatrist was... and a psychologist. Okay. And his job was to, uh, and the Army approved this, to take everything out of my brain mm -hmm. that I went through so that, you know, he didn't want anybody to know about it. So mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. Well, that's what, that's what he wanted to do. It's a lot about what yeah. this book is it's about, about is removing that type of... I had to go through brutal psychotherapy sessions and physical... I mean, it was terrible. It was really terrible. Right. So hypnosis was hypnosis performed. Hypnosis was part of it. Was a, lot, a large part of it. Was there any other aspects? Anything else you can describe? Other than the hypnosis and, and the uh, no. Was there anything to do with pictures or images that were flashed at you at any point? No. So simply hypnosis, and you were put under, and you don't know. Put under. What about any drugs? Were any drugs used? No. No drugs. No LSD or anything no. like that. Just the uh, officer that was hypnotizing me. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would sit. He would sit for hours and mm -hmm. hypnotize me and you know, talk to me. Do you have any suspicion that the CIA was involved in any of what you did? I don't think so, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. So your orders were given from an officer, a military officer, or army officer. When my, when I was when when, when you when were, I was yeah, your your crypto duties. Also, when I uh, 
when I, I left the military. Yeah, what? I'm sorry. When I left the military. Yes. Or when I tried to, they would they called me in and, and hypnotized me and expunged. The army thought it was best if I expunged everything, and they did. Uh, they didn't want me to remember all the missions and so all the stuff I went through. Do you think there are holes in your memory? From Probably. what? Probably. But you know they they uh, they did a good thorough job mm -hmm. taking them, mm -hmm. and the army uh, approved. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they understood. There was quite a bit of that being done at that brutal. stage. It was brutal, and a lot of it was done via CIA. CIA yes. had a lot of um, experimentation going on. LSD was part of that, and I, uh, I didn't. Rem I don't remember uh, being involved. In that, right, right. To be honest, I don't remember. That. That's good. But the army decided to expunge all these things from my memory. Right. They didn't want me to have the right. knowledge. And my career was over anyway mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really care one way or another. Right. That's about it. I mean, okay, so then you came back to the United States and you were you were then involved in um, NORAD? North American Air Defense Corps. Right. At what, Cheyenne Mountain? No, I was in the Niagara Frontier. Where? Niagara well, okay. Frontier. Yes, right, right, yes. That's where I was. Right, exactly. And um, can you tell us something about that? What were your experiences there? And that was. We were on a nickel. Uh, that's defense. A missile base. Right, you know, Dis missile, mi base. missile defense system. Yes. Army Air Defense mm -hmm. Corps. And uh, I was involved with uh, some of the deployments, but not all. And I spent some time there. And, uh, you know, and so you were nervous at the situation with the Kennedy assassination, where they went on alert and the missiles oh yeah. were brought out? Oh, yes. Scary times. They brought those missiles out. They're ten stories high. Now, now and they brought them out from the ground. These are Nikes, right? Yeah, Nike okay. missiles. Okay. Nike missiles. And do you have any idea where they were pointed at? Um, I don't think any of them were launched. Right, but but they must have had. But they were a defense. Right. You know, defensive right. situation. Right. If in fact we were. Of course, our, our hostile hostilities at that stage were with uh, the USSR, uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, we were just inches away from nuclear war at that stage. Right. That's correct. That's correct. The missiles of October, right. as it's been referred you, to. You see it here. Yeah. You see yes. It. it was in a scary time. Yes. A scary time. Yes. And, uh, you know, everything I did was to survive. I wasn't looking to be a hero. Right. I was just looking to survive. Take your orders and... Take my orders. And, you know, serve my country in any way that I could. I love this country and, and I was happy to serve. It was tough sometimes. It was hard. They didn't really, uh, you know, it wasn't like a bivouac thing or something that I could mm -hmm. sit down and mm -hmm. it was tough. Mm -hmm. I went to a hell. But here I am. So then you, um, you left the service. Yes. You moved into public life. I was discharged. Life. Right, discharged. And w at what point did the health issues start to manifest themselves. Was that rather quick? Or was that, did that take years for it to happen due to the Agent Orange? Because of my missions, yes. I had a lot of things like the Agent Orange and things right. like that. And uh, what else? I don't know what else. What, no, when did, what, how, in other words, how long did it take for it to manifest? Was it five years, ten years? The Agent Orange? Yes. That yeah. the cancer started. Yeah. yeah. After doing some of my missions, 
I mean, a lot of you started things. with you started with illnesses right away. Then. Well, no, but I got dropped in the middle of the Mekong Delta right, or right. Cambodia. So, I don't know where the hell so I was. So you were seeing the evidence yeah. of this Agent Orange affecting you to me. soon, they were right away. Me, right. I didn't realize that. For that. I thought it would took years for it to happen. Well, it may, it may, uh -huh. but with me, it was right away. It was quick because I was in the middle of the Mekong Delta. It was, right. you know, it was all over the place. Right. And, uh, you know, trying to neutralize the combatants. Yes. Because, you know, my lieutenant screaming at me to shoot him and kill him and all this. And I, I couldn't do that. I, I wounded him. I was a marksman. I have an M14. And I was a marksman. It's in my DV 214. So what I would do, I would shoot him in the leg. I would shoot him in the hand. You know, I wouldn't kill him. I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. And it's not easy know, to kill a man. No, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And they were the, en the enemy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the enemy, yeah. They would kill me because they were firing at the helicopter. They were helicopter. under orders, too. I, 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 part of my, uh, my story shows how they, uh, how they shot at our helicopter when we had to return the fire. Right. It was tough. This is it here. These not it says. And and I remember the lieutenant shouting at me to at us to neutralize the combatants. That's what he was yelling. And I had my rifle and I used it. Because they were shooting at us. They were hiding in these bushes and trees and everywhere. And that's why they shot them. Uh, uh, Agent Orange too. All right. So we could expose them. And I was on that mission. Now you also mentioned Cambodia. So we weren't really supposed to be in Cambodia. I don't know where stage. the hell we were. I can't yeah. tell you. I don't know where it was. It's either the Mekong Delta, somewhere in the Mekong Delta. That mm -hmm. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Cambodia, I think. Mm -hmm. I and know. Laos. And La no, not Laos. I don't not know. Laos. No. Cambodia, yes. Yes. Who's that, Jesse? Somebody's born. No, it's, he was right there. So. so what happens with all of this if the week gets done? Um, I, I'm not really quite sure. Um, I'm personally working on a, on a website, a blog, so to speak. Um, I haven't had a chance to uh, work on that lately. I've been having too many problems myself. Jesse says there's going to be a million and a half people watching this from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, that might be the case with really? YouTube. Could possibly be the case. I hope I can say s things that would help people who are listening to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I want to keep the Vietnam War alive. That's the reason I'm allowing this mm -hmm. to happen. Right. I want to make sure the beads on the work is a lot. Mm -hmm. It's important to me. Right. Understood. Yeah. You know, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. I want to make sure that uh, people don't forget. My particular expertise is with World War II. My interests are with Nazi Germany, and fascism. I'm an, I'm an anti fascist. As well, you should be. And uh, that's what my, the novel that I've written oh, wow. is about. Um, that's why Jesse thought that you'd like to speak to me, is because of my interest in American history. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in history, period. And, so Vietnam uh, was part of our history. Yeah, absolutely it was. And um, I wish you luck with the future with your health concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. I'm okay. <clears throat> okay. I mean, you know, I don't even want to think about some of the stuff I went through. But right. It was, it was now, it. do you ha did, have you covered everything that you wanted to? Is there anything else you'd like to point out about Vietnam War? It seems to me you've covered most everything from 
the bio that I read. I was I was drafted. Mm -hmm. I had to serve, and I did. Did I want to? Did I think it would be fun? No. Right. But I did because I because of our country. Right. Well, somebody has to do something. And I was uh, one of the people that would stand up and try to find a way to help our country, whatever way I could, until I was discharged. And after all that, I wound up being a, uh, well, you saw my, my, uh, Well, I applaud you in your service. Thank you. And I wish you the best at this point Thank on. You. Fellow Cornea. That's right. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. So I think we're and done. The, yeah. And the superintendent, his name was Bernstein, just like mine. And <laughs> people were, it was the worst thing that could have happened to me. <laughs> I think we're kind of done, Jess. Right on. He feels he's covered everything. Awesome. Uh, how do you feel? I do. I think from reading in your bio, I think you've covered everything. Okay. So, okay. so if it gives you any comfort, again, I want to raise that with the camera off. Um, the problem.